We are on the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel tonight, and this is the theme of this, these books are Judges Retire and Kings Begin to Reign. So we know that Yahweh is the true king of Israel, we talked about that, but now Israel is going to ask for human kings, and the beginning of Samuel is talking about the transition of how that happened. But just for, um, as a really quick review, not like last time where I reviewed the whole story, but we'll talk about what's happened in the Bible so far. So first, all the nations besides Israel, well, God hadn't created Israel, but all the nations reject God and start worshiping these other gods that were really just spiritual beings that God assigned to protect and do God's will um, to keep goodness among humanity. However, they seek worship of humans instead, and so human hearts are turned away from God. All humans are worshiping other gods. So God chooses a man named Abram and does a miracle, giving him a son at a very old age, 100 years old, and creates a nation through that son, through Jacob, who becomes Israel, using these 12 sons to become 12 tribes called Israel. And so they are, again, Reuben, the first, and this is the order they were born. So Reuben, Simeon, Levi, who the priests, and this tribe was chosen to be God's special tribe to serve him and be like the priests or the pastors, if they didn't have pastors, but that's what the Levi would be. And so because of that, they're not counted as one of the twelve, but they are the third. And Judah and the Jews will come from Judah. They're chosen to be leaders among the people. We talked about that. And after that, Dan, Naphtali, then Gad and Asher. then Issachar and Zebulun, then Joseph, who has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, who are each counted as one tribe, but they both come from Joseph. And they are also chosen as leaders, it's revealed. Benjamin is the last one, and the first king is going to come from him. So, these 12 sons become 12 tribes, a nation, it goes from 70 people to 2 million. And then they are led by Moses out of slavery in Egypt because they become slaves suffering in Egypt. And God shows who he is, not only in his power, but also in his love by setting slaves free from Egypt. Led by a man God chooses to be the first leading prophet of Israel named Moses. And Moses is not a king, but he's the leader of all Israel as God's chosen prophet, his representative, to be God's voice. The prophet is uh, the king's voice, because Yahweh, God is the king, but the prophet is his microphone, or his voice, the way that he speaks to the people. So Moses is the first one. He leads the people through the wilderness, and then Joshua comes up next to lead them into their promised land. And then from there, after Joshua dies, everyone gets their inheritance. But the thing is, Joshua, he didn't conquer the whole promised land because they were promised a certain land. Abraham was promised. They only partially conquered it. So we are now in the partial promised land. And by this time, this land that is becoming Israel is a melting pot of Israelites, of Philistines, of Canaanites, which were the native people that were still there, but the Philistines were coming into. And then other empires had fallen, the Hittites in the north, so Hittites were coming in, so, and Egyptians were coming in from the south. So this area that is the partial promised land is now a melting pot in the book of Judges, and it's going to continue that way in what we're talking about tonight in Samuel. So just remember that. It's not just Israelites. This land is now a melting pot of all these different peoples, so Gentiles and God's chosen people. This is the promised land, the borders. Can you all see it okay from there? Hopefully. But um, look at how big that is. It includes this part of Egypt that's east of the Nile. It includes the whole area where Mount Sinai was. It includes this whole area, which is typically thought, usually it's just this small area right here that is thought of as the promised land. But the borders that God gave Abraham in Genesis 15 include this whole area, all the way up into this area, which would have been the Hittite Empire, the, where the Arameans are, all these other people groups, 
Um, Wait, Armenians? Yeah, I'm sorry, Arameans. Is that different or than Armenians? It's different than Armenians. Oh, really? Yeah. They're different people? They are, yeah. Because the Armenians are. Um, not Armenians. Armenians are here. Armenians. Armenians, thank you. I'm getting oh, is that what Armenians are more this way, and they're going to come in way later after the Bible. I never after heard the of Armenians or whatever. Uh, Some people call them Syrians, but Syria, because they're where Syria is now, that's where they were. Oh. But um, back in the day, they were Armenians, the people of Aram. A R A M. Sorry for the confusion on that, yeah. So Damascus was their capital, though. And, um, and then you had the Canaanites in there, and then some of the Greek peoples of Cyprus were over here. The Philistines are probably coming from there, too. Um, so all these peoples, and then maybe even a little bit of Assyria and Babylon, but those are more east of the, of the land. So this, this is the land that was promised. They're never, no one's ever going to attain those borders, not yet. Which means that one day, Jesus probably will establish a kingdom in these borders, in the millennial reign. We're not talking about eschatology right now. <laughs> but it's very interesting to think about that. Because those are, that is specifically the land that was promised. Wow. But David, who we're going to talk about tonight, is going to expand it further than it ever went before. But before that, this is what Joshua led the people into. So we zoomed in. Notice, if you're curious, we're zooming in into this area. You'll see the bottom of this. You see the bottom of that right there? And so this is the area that Joshua gave to the tribes once they conquered everything. This is all their inheritances. And so uh, I'll just point out two of them. Judah is down here in the south. See this kind of light brown area? That's all Judah, which is close to Benjamin. Jerusalem is kind of on the border of Benjamin and Judah, but they don't have Jerusalem yet. And then up here is Ephraim and Manasseh, where Shechem is. So... Why I'm pointing that out is because it's going to become very important when we talk about the kings. Um, so Ephraim and Manasseh are more in the northern territory, and Judah with Benjamin and Simeon is down here in the south. Now on the coastal, after Joshua, you have the Philistines coming in. That's this whole gray area on the coast. And then the Canaanites, who were still powerful, because all the Canaanites that were here were being subjugated by the Israelites. But the... Uh, the Canaanites that were still keeping their power in their cities moved to this purple coast right here, and you can see they're dwindling. And some of them were starting to go this way, where they will become the Carthaginians, who will fight the Romans later on, Hannibal and all that. Um, so that was the situation under Joshua, which leads into Judges. So here we are in Judges. You have the same map. See Judah there, Benjamin, um, Manasseh, and Ephraim. You can see it more clearly there. And this is the situation in Judges. So, we talked about the Judges last time. Um, during the time of Judges, you had no national prophet. It's not that nobody ever talked to God. There were some rare prophets, like Deborah, who was a judge, was also a prophetess. But there's no prophet who leads the whole nation. But now, at the beginning of our story in Sam, uh, Samuel, which is why it's named Samuel, is Samuel, who's the, the first national prophet of the whole nation since Joshua. And he's going to be the king, Yahweh's voice. But before that, we talked about in Judges how the only government they really had were Sanhedrins, which is these local like congresses or councils. And there was one of those, see all the different territories, there's 12 of them, 12 tribes. There was one Sanhedrin in each territory, and they were responsible for making sure their tribe was okay. And it was a confederacy, so confed like the United States before it was united, it was a confederacy of states. So what that means is that it's not really united, but we'll help each other if we need to, because we're, we're each our own, each tribe, because we're our own thing. And so they each had a Sanhedrin, but then they also each had Levites that were scattered all over, and the Levites were responsible for bringing the people closer to God. But we talked about how they were failing to do that. They were becoming corrupt. And Eli, who's the, the judge at the beginning of Samuel, is also a Levite. And he's very corrupt, and so are his sons. So we're going to talk about him. But they had these judges, which were these temporary military chiefs, chosen to save and lead their local regions. But Eli, tonight, is both a Levite and a judge, and Samuel's going to be as well. 
There's no central authority right now. So the book of Judges, uh, excuse me, the book of uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel, opens in this situation that's the book of Judges. And that enters into Hannah and the birth of Samuel. So Yahweh raises up the first national prophet since Joshua. So the age of Judges ends with the wickedness of Eli and the righteousness of Samuel. So there's this guy named Eli. And first of all, he's described as being a very fat man. And why, <laughs> why is that a big deal? Because it's showing that people were poor in the land. Like there are people that are starving and suffering, and he's just like eating all for himself and his sons. And it talks about how his sons would stick the fork in the food and they'd take as much as they wanted. They'd just help themselves. It would be like a church that was abusing the tithes and offerings and taking all the money for themselves. Um, indulgences, the Catholic Church did, which is why Martin Luther did his thing, if you guys have heard that story. Um, but in the context of this, there's this woman named Hannah who's one of two wives of this guy named Elkanah. And Elkanah, he loves Hannah the most, but Hannah can't have any children. And in those days, if you can't have children as a woman, you have no worth. And I know that sounds terrible, and it is terrible, but that was just how people thought about it back then. If you couldn't have children as a woman, it was like, well, what's your purpose? Because the men do all the hard stuff, go out where if you can't give sons, so that there's more men for the men, and then why can't you, what's your purpose in society? And so women would taunt each other. Women that could have children would be like, ha ha, you can't have children. And that's what her um, wife was not her sister, I don't think. I mean, it doesn't say, but it doesn't seem like it was her sister. But Elkanah had two wives. Hannah, Hannah was his favorite, but she, she couldn't have children. He had another wife, and she had children. So she's making fun of Hannah. But they go up every year to Shiloh, because at this time, this map right here in the corner, Shiloh was the holy city. It was, there was no Jerusalem yet at this point. There was, it was called Jebus, but it was still belonged to the Jebusites. It was a mix of Jebusites, um, Judahites, or Jews and uh, Benjamite, so it was a mix of those people, but the people, the king of Jebus still ruled over it, so it wasn't fully controlled by the Israelites. So Shiloh was the holy city, and every year Elkanah would go up to Shiloh with, with Hannah and to, to worship the Lord. And again, that was in the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, who were the other in the north. There's a reason I'm commenting on that, because we're going to talk about it next week. But anyway, so, okay. I don't want to blow you guys too much. Sorry if I'm doing that. Um, okay, so, so Hannah goes up there to worship the Lord. She can't have children, and so she prays to the Lord, please give me a son. Please give me a son. If you give me a son, I will give him to you his whole life. I won't even raise him or keep it. You can have him. I just want to have a son. And she's so passionate in her prayer. It talks about she's just mouthing the words like, that Eli, that this wicked high priest, because he wasn't just any Levite. Uh, Eli was the high priest, so he was the Messiah. When we talk about the Messiah of that generation. And he's the one that people are supposed to look to. He's also the judge of that generation. So he's like the man with the most authority. And he sees her and says, why are you drunk? Like, how, how dare you come to God's house, like, drunk? But she's not even drunk. She's just in passionate prayer because he doesn't even know. He's just disconnected from God. That's how it's portrayed. And then she explains, I'm not drunk. I'm just begging God that he'll let me have a son. And then he says, well, God's going to grant your request. And so he does, and that is Samuel. So Samuel, from his father, we know this, um, was a Levite. However, he was one of the Levites that lived in the territory of Joseph, of Ephraim specifically. He was called an Ephraimite. But he's a Levite, otherwise he wouldn't be eligible to be a um, to be a priest. And so he is then taken, after Hannah gives birth to him, she sings the song Celebration to God, and then after that she goes up to Shiloh and basically gives him up to the Lord there, because that's what it's supposed to be. Um, so Samuel then becomes a priest in the holy city of Shiloh. And uh, at this point, this is the official spiritual capital of Israel, Shiloh. 
This was the location of Yahweh's tent that we talked about that they built with Moses. Um, it had moved to Shiloh. And they also built some sort of, this is kind of a mystery because it doesn't describe how, but they built some sort of temple there. So it's called the house of Yahweh. So they had some sort of temple at Shiloh, not as nice as Solomon's. It's going to come later. But they had some sort of temple at Shiloh, and the Ark of the Covenant was there, um, which had inside of it, I don't think I ever said this before, but inside the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments, the two stone tablets, the Aaron's staff that budded, the, uh, the, that confirmed the authority of the Levites, and then um, some of the manna, that they God gave manna to feed the Israelites, the miracle in the wilderness. And so all that was inside the Ark of the Covenant, and this was viewed as a throne of God. So sometimes... If the Israelites were in trouble, they would take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. And that, I mean, they really weren't probably supposed to do that. But um, that's what ends up happening. So let's now talk about Eli and the destruction of Shiloh. I already talked about Eli. He's this wicked high priest, so he's the Messiah of that generation. He's a judge and a high priest. He's supposed to be serving the people, offering the sacrifices, drawing them closer to God. But his sons are extremely wicked. Um, let me see if I have this on here. So, not only were his sons taking more food from the people, because the people would bring sacrifices to show their love for God. And the animals that they sacrificed were their animals. It was their own food, basically. It was like they were bringing their food to these priests, as a, to, to God, to offer it to God, to show their love. And the priests were not only taking a ton of these sacrifices, um, for themselves and not they were supposed to share it with the people so the priest was supposed to just randomly stick a fork in and take out whatever god put on the fork that's what they were supposed to have that kind of faith but they were purposely his sons were looking and picking the best pieces of meat they could find as much as they wanted and then giving just little bits back to the people <laughs> and not only that it says that there were women that came and were serving somehow the lord at the tabernacle and Eli's sons were having sex with all the women outside the tabernacle. And it was just a really, you know, sad to say, there's been situations like this in church history, which just goes to show there's nothing new under the sun. But yeah. anyway, this was Eli. And so because of that, Garbage. Eli and his sons, uh, God decides it's time to destroy Shiloh. Because he's going to judge all Shiloh. Well, first... He chooses Samuel to replace Eli um, because Samuel's righteous. And, and Samuel specifically says, starts hearing the Lord. And it says the word of the Lord before that was rare, which means that people weren't normally hearing the Lord. There was another prophet who actually condemned Eli um, at the beginning of Samuel. He says, God will judge you for this when he sees all the evil that's happening. But basically what happens is the Philistines, remember those Philistines, they're still the main enemy right now of the people of Israel. In fact, the Philistines are getting really powerful in the land. They're even, I would say, on equal standing with the Israelites at this point. And so the Philistines are coming against Israel because of their wickedness. And in this process, Shiloh gets destroyed. So they're, they're in battle with the, at this place called Ebenezer. Um, yes, like the guy from uh, Scrooge. Scrooge. <laughs> That's where his name comes from, Ebenezer. Ebenezer. But... Um, they're at this battle, the Israelites, and they're losing. So they're like, well, we need the Ark of the Covenant. So they carry the Ark of the Covenant towards the battle. The Philistines wipe out all the Israelites, including Eli's sons. They kill them all. They steal the Ark, and they destroy Shiloh. So they destroy the Holy City. It's very devastating. It would have been a very devastating thing for that time. And they carry the Ark all the way to their Philistine cities. Gosh, God. <laughs> and this is where God has some fun. So... <laughs> To show that this is his throne and he doesn't need anybody to defend himself. Um, so what happens is basically God starts sending plagues on the Philistines. They First they set the ark in front of this big old idol statue of Dagon as like a way to mock the God of Israel. And then they come in the next day and Dagon is face down like bowing down before <laughs> the Lord. Wow. And this big old idol statue. And then they set it back up, and they're like, well, that's kind of weird. And then they go in, they leave. <laughs> the next day they come in, and it's bowed down, and its head is chopped off, oh. and its hands, which is a sign of all your power that you have, is in your hands and your head, because they're very Whoa. visual people, the Hebrews. 
So, or not just the Hebrews, but that whole culture. Yeah. And so basically, um, this idol has no power, and uh, the God of Israel just chopped off his head and uh, defeated him, basically. And so they're freaking out. And then God starts sending all these plagues on them with tumors and all this stuff. And they're like, we got to get rid of this thing. Like this. And then, then they say, this is the God who delivered Israel out of Egypt. We remember what he did in Egypt now. Now that they're seeing all this stuff, we're like, oh, yeah, this God is like a, a God who has power. we got to get this thing out of here. So they basically separate. They take uh, two cows who just had a newborn baby, mother cows. And these mother cows love their baby, right? They're like, they would never leave their baby. But we're like, well, we're going to test to see to make sure like that this is really this God that's doing this. And it's not just by chance. And so they separate these baby cows from their mothers, set the ark on a cart carried by these two mothers that are separated from their children. And they just sit there and see what will happen. And the mother cows leave their children and take the ark all the way back. Huh into the land of Israel, <laughs> um, proving that like they were God. moved by God more than they were moved by their own. They literally left their children behind, these mother cows, so that they could bring the ark in, back into Israel. Holy crap. Um, and at this point, it's just kind of, it's a hilarious story, but it's meant to show the holiness of God because everywhere the ark goes, it's causing trouble. Like the plague is like following it because like it's showing like God is mad that his people have rejected him. It, once it comes back into Israel, in this border territory, Beth Shemesh, then there's plagues happening there, and the Israelites are like freaking out. Like, what do we do? And so they, they throw it over here in this place called Kiriath Yerim, or Kiriath Yerim, and it just sits there for many years until David will eventually carry the ark into Jerusalem once David will conquer. But that all happens later. But for now, the ark is just going to rest in Kiriath Yerim for a while. And it's just a sign, again, that the people have rejected their king, but he's still the, the king. He doesn't need the Israelites to defend him. He's God. And that's the point Where's of the ark now? Where is it now? It's been lost. I have a whole book on it. I'll sh remind me to show you after, but it's mm. interesting. It shows all the we journey. Go find it. Yeah. Um, what'd you say? We should go. He said we should go find it. What about that one dude? Oh, yeah. I mean, it? we'd be rich people if we did that. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, no What'd you say? What about that one dude that claimed he found it? I remember hearing about that a long time ago. Yeah, it supposedly he found Noah's Ark, too. Yeah, that was in, like, Russia? Yeah, I think so. I have to look into that again. I'm sure most people, was, like, not most people, but a lot of people would contest that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I don't know. All right, how would you identify that? It, it was pure gold, so the Ark was made of pure gold. Supposedly, uh, they... Uh, pretty much. Well... I remember like the place gold. that they found it is, uh, it talks about, I think it's in a psalm, how the blood from Jesus drips on the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. So the place they looked for it is a cave underneath the, the hill where Jesus was crucified. Yeah. So that's why they believed it was there. What was that? Because there was literally blood that went through the ground. I remember hearing it that you probably sent that to me. So that's actually the shower in a, Oh, that's my parents' room right there. So oh, my mom's room is the shower. So. Oh, okay. Oh, that so, makes sense. Yeah. Um, this <laughs> brings us this to is all your parents' room. This whole thing. Yeah, their room is huge. Whoa. And, well, this is just the bathroom, actually. Oh my god. The bathroom is huge. It's a that's massive tub the, in there. This whole section is the bathroom. There's a massive tub in there. And anyway, yeah. Sorry, guys. Watch me later. <laughs> I was like, what is all this about? All right. <laughs> I would love to get and like, look and see what it looks like one day. <laughs> um, it's a mess right now, but one day it'll be clean. <laughs> and I'll show you if I can. When Jesus comes back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Love, love, Daniel. Love, love. <laughs> so, um, they, this guy brings a report back to Eli the high priest, because he was still alive. He didn't get killed in battle, but his sons did. They tell him everything that happened. And when Eli hears that the Ark of God got taken by the Philistines, he's so, like, stunned by it, and he's a big old fat man, he <laughs> falls backwards, his chair breaks his neck, and dies. And then after this, <laughs> this is true, <laughs> this is what happens, and That's after so this... Sad, but it is <laughs> <laughs> I forget. I forget what happened to him. He just 
falls, he falls backwards and he breaks his neck. The weight of his body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, probably the way he landed. So. Yeah. He could have fallen backwards. And, but anyway. The point is in the story, God has judged him in his house. And now Samuel is going to replace him. So Samuel becomes three things in Israel. He's already confirmed as a prophet. So Samuel's already the first national prophet. But now God lifts him up as the high priest. So he becomes the Messiah of that generation. And a judge of the people. So he leads the people in battle and in victory. Super promoted. And so he's, he's the only one who's all three, a prophet, a yeah. judge, and a high priest. Out of the entire Bible. Of that, uh, other than like Jesus, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because no one else was a high priest. Actually, David acted as a priest, so you could debate. But not the high priest, though. No, uh, no order of Melchizedek, but yeah, okay. I didn't. Well, that's <laughs> pretty interesting. Well, I was just going to say, also, he's the only prophet in the entire Bible that says no word he gave ever fell to the ground. Right. Meaning yep. every single word he ever gave was perfect. Right. Wow. Yeah. He's the only one in the Bible that says that about. Huh. Yeah. He was also Nazarite. Not a lot of people talk about that, but oh, like wow. Samson, so he had dude, that. <laughs> he would have had <laughs> hair down to here, like gray. If, if there old. are spiritual Whoa. resumes, this dude is right. stacked. <laughs> oh yeah, he's like forget it. That, and that's, so that's one of the points of the story is that Samuel is this. Samuel, Samuel is this dude. like super amazing leader. And he does great. He leads Israel for yeah, his whole he life. Mess it up. He really does it the whole time. Even after he dies. <laughs> um, and what happens, though, is that when that Samuel sense. gets old, after all the success that he has, his sons start, well, he's like, well, someone's going to need to replace me. And you can kind of tell there's this feeling among the Israelites and in the story that they're ready for sons to like take over of a good leader as a father because they're just expecting that the sons will be good sons too. But there's this weird thing in the Bible where it's just like the sons are just sometimes not the way the father is. And this is going to continue, I'm sure, as you remember, for those of you who know the king stories. Mm -hmm. But his sons are these very wicked men, and they start doing some of the same things that Eli's sons were doing. But he wasn't wicked. So, but because of his wicked sons, where it's talked about them taking bribes and mostly financial corruption, they were doing these things to make themselves rich and impoverish the other Israelites. And because Samuel's sons are so wicked, um, the people come and basically say, we don't want your sons, we don't want you, we want a king. And so that's the con. And so it makes sense from the eyes of the people, but notice what God says here. Um, and I put it the second point of point A here. Israel's consistent corruption gives them human kings. They've been rejecting Yahweh, the God, their God, who's supposed to be their king. They've been rejecting him again and again and again and again. So finally, it says at the bottom in 1 Samuel 8, 7, the first verse, Then Yahweh said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. From being king over them. However, you will warn them with protest and declare to them the judgment of the king who will reign over them. And we're not going to go through the passage, but after this, Samuel basically declares, because you've asked for a human king, you're going to get a human king. And you're going to see why it would have been better to have Yahweh as your king, because Yahweh is holy and perfect. And these human kings are going to lift themselves up above you just like you think of a king of any other nation. They're going to lift yourself, themselves up above you. They're going to tax you like crazy. They're going to take your daughters as wives. They're going to force your son to fight battles for them. They're going to do all these horrible things because they're going to be a tyrant over you. They're not going to love you like God loves you and be a, be a good king like he is. And so that's the judgment of the king. And we're going to see that in the book of Kings. And we're going to see that even with David. Um, the dark side of David, which we'll talk about the end tonight. Um, so that's the judgment that Samuel proclaims on the people. But after that, he seeks the Lord about, okay, who should be the first king? And so in that context, Yahweh chooses Saul. And Saul is, this is his heritage. Remember, this is the 12 tribes of Israel we talked about, a little genealogy. Saul is from Benjamin. And if you recall... Remember how we talked about in the book of Judges that night? We talked about this horrible civil war that was started over the Levite and his concubine. They chopped her up into 12 pieces and sent her all over because it's so horrible. 
Well, that war happened at a specific place in Benjamin called Gibeah. Gibeah. Well, Saul is from that city. Saul is from Gibeah, the very same city that the people remember. Oh, that city? <laughs> so it's like, and the Bible specifically says he's from the smallest family of the smallest clan of the smallest tribe in Benjamin. And God chooses him to be the first king of Israel. So the idea here is that this is redemption for Gibeah and for the whole tribe of Benjamin by making that man who's the smallest and the least the king of Israel. And that's just like God to do when you... As you learn uh, how the Lord is throughout the Bible, the last shall be first. He's choosing this man to be the leader, the human leader. But to be a good king, Saul must seek the Lord. Um, and King Saul, he has a strong start, but he ultimately listens to his people above Yahweh. And it's a really sad story, honestly, because it talks about how God gives Saul a new heart. He's prophesying with the other prophets. Um, and then there's the saying, is Saul also a prophet, like in Israel, because of that? And um, he has a strong start. Um, now, I do need to mention something politically about Saul. So this is the kingdom. Notice how now it's just one kingdom, because all 12 tribes, they're no longer a loose confederacy. They're a united kingdom now. One. And so this is their kingdom, though. But what do you notice about this? There's a couple, couple things. This is what they inherited with Joshua, right? So this is what they had when Judges started. This is what they had with Saul. So that is how much they lost during the book of Judges because of all the enemies that God lifted up and brought against them. So Saul inherits this, and it's pretty unstable. It's, uh, he's got to do a lot of work to make the people strong in the land. Not only that, the Philistines are going stronger, as you can see on the coast, and so are the Canaanites up here along the coast. But they're starting to move, as you can see, too. Um, so they have some strong enemies. They also, it doesn't show it on this map, but they have enemies over here in Moab and Edom. So they still have all these enemies of the Gentiles, and Saul has to deal with all of this in his kingdom. So like I said, he has a strong start but ultimately, Saul has this problem where he cares more about what people think than he cares about God. And God does not like this because it leads him to rebel, not once, but twice. And because of this, Yahweh rejects Saul from being king over Israel. And uh, in that context, God specifically says, I'm going to seek a man after my own heart. Because Saul, just his heart was with the sinful Israelite people. It was not with God, the true king of Israel. So, in this context, God begins to lift up a young man named David, who's from the tribe of Judah. So David is from Judah, who we already know there was prophecy that Judah will be rulers in the land. And Judah is going, David is going to replace Saul after his death. Um, so Samuel secretly, because at this point Saul's king, and Samuel still has a lot of authority, but Samuel secretly goes and anoints David in front of just his family. But that's just the first time. So he will be king in the future, but for now, what's going to happen? Um, David is going to be lifted up in Saul's government. And so when we meet David for the first time, he's just this little shepherd boy. And I mean like the last, he's the eighth child of his father. And there's some hints in the text, this is debated, um, but there's some hints in the text that David may have been born from an affair right, that Jesse had with another woman who wasn't the mother of his other brothers. Because he's not treated very well compared to his other brother. It's like his father's trying to hide him. Like he's a bastard. Yeah. Is that like, yeah, exactly. Like Jon Snow. Exactly. So, now we don't know for sure, but there's some hints, hints about that. So it's possible. Also, look at his genealogy. He's, his great-grandmother is a Moabite woman. What well, she, of course, served the God of Israel, but she was a Moabite. And his great-great-grandmother was a Canaanite prostitute, Rahab. 
So his genealogy, and then even Judah, going back to Tamar, was a Canaanite. So the whole line of Judah, in some of the eyes of Israel, was tainted, if you look at it from the flesh. Um, so, but when David starts to meet him, he's this small shepherd boy. His father's just keeping him out in the field. And Samuel, God is telling Samuel, no, there's another son, there's another son. Because even Samuel is looking at all the other sons and being like, oh, they're tall, they're strong, they'd be a great king. But no, David, who's shorter, because Saul was very tall, he's shorter than Saul. He's this redhead, probably a redhead. It calls him ruddy, which means red. Um, so he was red in a way that other Israelites were not red. Um, but there's also this weird tradition of portraying the kings of Judah with red hair. So they probably, and there were redheads in the Middle East. There are studies that confirm that. Um, so yeah, whoever, if anyone ever taught you that redhead was a, only a Scottish and an Irish thing way over there, that's not true. There's redheads in other places. Uh, but David was probably a redhead. Um, so this redheaded kid takes care of the sheep. And then what happens is God takes the Holy Spirit away from Saul. And because of that, it opens a vacuum where Satan is allowed to give him the spirit of torment. And so he's in torment constantly. So he needs a musician in his court to play music to help him just be at peace. And so David can play music. David's a skilled musician as well as a shepherd. So David is brought as a musician into Saul's court. And then um, there's this incident where this giant among the Philistines, so one of those descendants of the Nephilim named Goliath, comes and starts dominating the Israelites, leading the Philistines, and nobody wants to stand up to him. And in that context, David brings his brother's food, because they're in the Israelite army. So David brings his brother's food, and... Um, he sees Goliath taunting the people. But also, and I should mention this because lest we think David had purely, only pure motives, so he hears Goliath taunting the God of Israel and Israel, but he also hears that King Saul promised to give one of his daughters and great riches an exemption from taxes, all those three things, to any man that will defeat Goliath. And the king did that because the king's afraid. He doesn't want to defeat <laughs> Goliath. None of the people did. So he's like, hey, I'll give you my daughter. You can have a princess as your, as your wife. Um, you'll be the king's son-in-law. You'll get rich. I'll give you all this money. And you'll never have to pay taxes again. Because now that they have a king, all the Israelites have to pay taxes. And what that looked like is giving their sons and the army, giving daughters sometimes if there was a daughters for whatever. So... You wouldn't have to do that. You wouldn't be a servant of the king. So there were huh, benefits that weren't just spiritual that David could have been motivated by as well. God knows his heart. But it also says that he saw how he was taunting um, the God of Israel. David didn't like that. And he can't believe that nobody will stand up. And that nobody wants to claim these cool rewards that you get. So um, for all these reasons, David in his faith, goes to slay Goliath, and the king gives him armor at first and a big old sword. It's all heavy because David's just a teenage boy at this time. And he says, I, I have the Lord. Why do I need these other weapons? God is with me. And he goes to the creek, and he gets little stones because he had a sling, and this is how he killed animals because it talks about how David, when he was a shepherd, there were these bears and lions that would come to attack um, the sheep, and so, and I love, if you've seen the David movie, uh, not the, the movie itself, but the preview for the movie, it's gonna be an awesome movie. We saw the trailer when we were seeing The Chosen, but uh, there's this epic scene where he like dives off a cliff to like get the sheep and saves the sheep. But David did a lot as a shepherd. He talks about his experience. One of the things he did was he would kill multiple wild animals like bears and lions just with a slingshot. And so, with that faith, he's like, I'm going to take out Goliath like I took out one of these lions with bears. Oh, yeah. It actually specifically says that David grabbed a lion by the beard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's so going to got... go up to a lion and grab it by the beard? <laughs> right. That is what David did. <laughs> so, not only with the slingshot, but he got into hand to hand combat with wild animals. All that, right. That's a, that's you a man. You come here, who... lion, it's time to die. That's a man who knows how to fight. He's a <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> this dude's ready to go. And a man with a lot of boldness and faith. And so, in this context, David slays Goliath with just the slingshot. And it goes, it says that God causes the stone to go all the way through his, like, into his head. And then Goliath falls down, and David takes Goliath's own sword and chops off. It would have been super heavy, because Goliath was huge. So he takes Goliath's sword and chops off Goliath's head and holds it up and say, Okay, Philistines, who wants some? Basically, and the Philistines freak out and start running away. And then all Israel cheers, and they chase after the Philistines and start slaying them. And this is the beginning of the Israelites starting to gain the upper hand against the Philistines. Until... Saul gets jealous. So what happens is, um, well, David meets Jonathan. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that, but Jonathan himself had a warrior's heart and more faith than his father. That was a, um, my namesake in the Bible, but um, he, uh, there's a story about him, how he has faith and more, more faith than his father and his father's wicked. There's a story that shows that he's more righteous than his father and um, but he humbly basically acknowledges that David should be king, and he'll support David to be king, even though he was the firstborn. So Jonathan should have been in line to be king, but he's like, no, you deserve it more than I do, because he just saw that, that David was like the one that God had chosen. And then his own father tries to kill him, actually, later on, Jonathan, because he's so mad that um, Jonathan supports David to be the next king instead of them, their own line. But... Uh, so David becomes a general in Saul's army, and victory after victory after victory, like nothing but victory over the Philistines, no matter what. And he's just slaying the Philistines. And Saul had some victories over the Philistines, but not all the time. And so there's this saying among the women who are like coming out with their tambourines and whatever, um, Saul has slain thousands, but David ten thousands. And Saul is pissed about that. It's like, I'm the king. What are you talking about? <laughs> so David's playing his music one day when Saul's being tormented, and Saul just decides to take his spear and try to nail David to the wall. And so he throws the spear, and David dodges it. And then this happens twice, and so then David starts to run. And he's still a general in the Israelite military. He had all these men under him. But basically, David's forced to live in caves. He even has to go over to the land of the Philistines, outside of the land so that he's running away from Saul. And King Saul basically starts a civil war to make all Israel go against David because he hates him so much. He's so jealous of him. But the, we see a lot of David's honor in this situation because um, David always honors Saul as Yahweh's Messiah. And this, that word Messiah, again, we, we've only seen it used so far about the high priest, but now we're seeing it used of kings. And Saul is the first one. So David calls Saul Yahweh's Messiah, that word in Hebrew, Messiah, specifically that word, which is also Christ. That's in Greek, that's Christ. So the idea is that Saul is this anointed one, God, one that God has chosen. And because of that, David is like, I will not kill him. There's two opportunities that David has to kill Saul, where Saul's going to the bathroom. Excuse me, Saul's going to the bathroom in this cave, and David has a chance to kill him. So he just cuts off a piece of his garment and he says, I could have killed you, but I will not put my hand on Yahweh's Messiah, on his anointed. God's chosen you to be king. And I'm not going to kill you. And so David shows so much honor in this situation, even though Saul continually tries to kill him. And then Saul will repent and be like, oh, I'm so sorry, David. You were right. I'm wrong. And then he goes away and then he comes back because he gets jealous again. So Saul's just all over the place and he's portrayed as this very unstable man. A lot of people think, well, people that are not, don't believe in like spiritual things that look at this think that Saul was mentally ill because he displays patterns of just like bipolar and like other, he's just all over the place. Um, so Saul continues his treachery until his shameful death by impalement and post-mortem crucifixion. So what happens is that at the end of the book of 1 Samuel, so, so Samuel dies, finally. Samuel was still around. He was just in the background as a prophet. He was just a spiritual, and he was the high priest. So he was just serving Israel in a spiritual way. But um, he wouldn't even see Saul after Saul rebelled against God twice because he's like, no, like you're not a worthy king. <laughs> um, but then Samuel dies, and Saul is faced with this huge battle against the Philistines at this place called Mount Gilboa. And... It doesn't look good. 
for Israel. And all Saul, Saul's sons are there, Jonathan and everybody. Um, and he's worried what's going to happen. He's seeking the Lord. Saul's seeking the Lord. Please, Lord, will you be with me? And the Lord won't answer him. And so he's forced to go to this witch. He finds a witch somewhere hidden in the land because there weren't supposed to be witches in Israel. In fact, King Saul himself had banished <laughs> witches from the land because Israelites weren't supposed to be in this pagan stuff with other gods and magic and witchcraft. But um, he finds a witch of Endor. <laughs> it always makes me think of Star Wars. Yeah. I wonder if he got it from there, but yes, the witch of Endor. And he's like, I want to talk to Samuel. Please bring up... Uh, do you know what Samuel Endor means? What? I don't off the top of my head. I have to, I have to look at it. That's okay, but, I'll look it up for you. Um, so, and then what's crazy is that Samuel actually comes up, and he's recognized as God. That's the other interesting thing. He's called an Elohim. So he comes up, and he basically prophesies in a judgment against Saul, saying, why have you disturbed me? Like, how dare you do this? God's going to kill you tomorrow, and you're going to join me here which I won't get off on but think about that wait a minute you're going to join me here where is he wrote to Samuel that Saul would join him if Saul was really wicked but anyway I won't get into that right now but it's an interesting thing in the story and so basically Saul laments he won't even eat any food at first he won't eat for a couple hours and then someone's like are you sure you don't want to eat they come and he's like okay give me some food he's like <laughs> he starts yeah. eating so Samuel is uh, good and then Saul was wicked. He's Saul was wicked. Samuel. Right. Exactly. Like, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, so, but... Ooh. Well, wasn't it, we wasn't talk about that man, too? He was, like, paradise for Jail. a little... Yeah. Right. That, that comes into the discussion, yeah. That there may have been two parts of the same place in the Old Testament. Um, but, yeah, that's this is one of the scriptures that's like, wait a minute, why would... Yeah. So when Saul dies, he, of course, dies in battle. What happens is that he gets shot with an arrow. I think it's an arrow. He's somehow wounded. He's, he, all his sons are dead. And he's laying there, and he knows that the Philistines find him. They're going to torture him and mess with him. And so he begs. Uh, well, first, he decides he's going to try to kill himself. So he jumps on his own sword, Saul, and he, he stabs himself through in, and he accidentally impales himself. So instead of him killing himself, he's just stuck on his own sword like a shish kebab. And then, yeah, I know, terrible, right? And then he's like, please kill me. There's this Amalekite coming by. And um, the Amalekites hated the Israelites. And the, God had declared they'd be at war forever, back in the time of Moses, because the Amalekites just constantly tried to wipe out Israel all the way into the time of Esther. We get into Esther because the Amalekites are still... Because Saul was supposed to, he had an opportunity to kill all the Amalekites, Saul did, but he didn't because he thought that it just, oh, uh, in his own mind, it was just better to leave the king alive. And because he did that, um, someone's able to get away and the Amalekites survive until the book of Esther. But basically, um, this Amalekite, not only that, but there's this other Amalekite now who's running by who survived because of what Saul did. And Saul's begging this Amalekite, please kill me. And so the Amalekite kills him with the sword. And then David will literally, not literally, later kill the Amalekite uh, for killing King Saul. He's like, how dare you kill the king of Israel? Um, and because the Amalekite comes to David thinking he'll get support. Like, David, David, I killed your enemy. Saul. <laughs> woo, woo, make me powerful in your government. And David's like, how dare you kill the king of Israel? And so he kills the Amalekite wow. for killing Funny story. It just shows David's honor, too. But after, um, I mentioned okay. the crucifixion. So Endor means, like, spring well of generation or of habitation. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting name. It makes more sense than Star Wars when it in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so I say post modem crucifixion here. Por Post-mortem means after death. I'm sure you guys probably know that. But uh, when they find, the Philistines find Saul's dead body, they cut off his head, but then his body they take and crucify on a wall of one of their cities. Um, 
by literally nailing it, like nailing into the wall, like after death. And this was actually how crucifixion developed. It started with, they would do this. They would kill somebody, cut off their head, and then nail the body like to the wall or to something, just as a way of like making the people horrified and like, um, actually, I'm sorry, they nail it to the wall of an Israelite city, not one of their, their cities. But Without the head? Mm -hmm. That sounds like the opposite of what like Game of Thrones and Medieval Times they would, they would put the heads on the spike. I think right? they put the head on a spike next to it or oh, something okay. like that. But the point is, is that this is where crucifixion comes from. The reason I say that is, is interesting is because Saul is called Messiah and after death he's crucified. It's showing how he's shamed. But I point that out just because it's an interesting when you're reading the original language. You're like, that's interesting. This first Messiah of Israel, he's like crucified after death. So he's shamed. Um, so I just wanted to point out that connection. Um, now, the civil war continues, though, even after Saul's dead, because he has one son who survived named Ishbosheth. And most of Israel, besides the people of Judah, support Ishbosheth. And um, then, so there's a war for several years between them. Basically, the people of Judah um, accept David as their king, so they anoint David at this place called Hebron, which is further south in the area of Judah. And so David's king there for a good seven years, I think. Um, and during that time, Ishbosheth is trying to like make himself a legitimate king of Israel, fighting against David. And the Philistines during this time are just taking advantage of the situation and trying to take more and more territory away. So they're fighting like two front wars with the Philistines, and then they're also fighting. Actually, I forgot to mention this. So David was kind of a smart guy, and he had made the Philistines think that he worked with them. He always betrayed them behind their back. And he, he tricked them to make them think. So during that time, actually, the Philistines were only fighting Ishbosheth, but they were not fighting David because they thought David was on their side. But it's because David was tricking them. He was a really brilliant military guy. Um, so eventually, uh, there's a story of how David's supporters are kind of treacherous, and one of David's supporters kills Ishbosheth. And in a dishonorable way, like when he's sleeping. And because of that, um, David declares a judgment on him and says, that was dishonorable, you shouldn't have done that. And there's just this running theme throughout uh, the book where David loves his enemies and wants to honor, even if they're his own people, if they're fellow Israelites, if they're people of God, David wants to honor them, even if they're his enemies. And that was a big deal in that time, because people didn't do that. Um, but ultimately, David and his supporters win the war, and David proves himself to love Yahweh with all that he is. And it's at this time that David becomes king over all of Israel, and this leads to the Israelite Golden Age, um, which to this day, you know, Jewish people today look back and say, we just want another David. <laughs> this is how long ago it was. Wow. This is like, David lived in like 1000 BC, so this was like 3000 years ago. Wow. The David, the, the story we're talking about. But David, uh, the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. He was the best human king that Israel ever had in terms of politics. Spiritually, he was not the best. Uh, Josiah was probably the best spiritually. Um, the Bible makes it clear. It says that about Josiah, that he was the best in terms of serving the Lord later on. But in terms of loving God, David loved God. And Politically, he was the best king of Israel. So this is Saul's kingdom, right? Um, I'll read this point E. David becomes king over all Israel and leads the Israelites into the greatest victory and prosperity that they would ever know. Um, so this is what he, David inherited, right? Or something like this. Because that's what Saul had. How small it is. This is what David does. Bam. Bam. So all the way down here, all the way up there, these people are becoming vassals. The Philistines are vassals. The Canaanites start becoming vassals. Everybody's paying taxes to David from the Gentiles and from everybody over here. Um, David conquers Jebus, Jerusalem, and it renames it Jerusalem. That becomes the new capital city of Israel. And uh, David sets up his palace there. Um, and then the uh, Canaanites again are starting to move out of the land because they're like, there's still some there, like Tyre. Uh, this, the king of Tyre was a good friend of David's, 
and gave him building materials for the temple later on, because David wants to build a temple for God. Um, a lot of the Philistines, because they were so conquered by David, they're like, um, we'll serve you, David. Like, you're, you're our king, like, you're a powerful guy. You'll be our king, we'll serve you. And so David ends up bringing in uh, Gentiles from Philistines, Hittites, Gittites, um, Edomites, Moabites. He brings in Gentiles and he conquers into his army. And so he like doubles or triples the Israelite army. But because he's bringing in all these Gentiles who are serving King David and they make covenants with him to serve him, um, even though they're gent Gentiles, they make David their king. And so this is the greatness of David politically. Uh, and this is why, on a political level, people loved him so much. Not on a spiritual level, but political level. And I say that because I want you to keep in mind, Christians are told all the time, and I think Jews too, how great David was on a spiritual level. And he was. But I want you to also see the human element of it in their time, because that's really important to see how he was viewed in his time, because otherwise it's not going to make sense what happens next. Um, so right now, David's this great man. He's, he does all these accomplishments, right? And in the context of that, David is sitting in his palace one day, and David had brought up the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and he put it in a tent in Jerusalem, in, in this tent. And he's sitting in his palace, and he says, why am I in a palace, but God's throne is in this tent? Like, God doesn't deserve to live in a tent. God should have a house bigger than my house. And so he wants to build a house or a temple for God in Jerusalem. And he's praying about this to God. And then because of that, there's this prophet named Nathan that comes to him and said, because, I'll read it here in um, 2 Samuel 7.13 at the bottom of the page. Um, so in response to David's heart desire to build a house for Yahweh he shall build a house for my name so God says to David or to, to Nathan about David he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever um, and so actually he's who he's talking to here isn't David he's talking to David's seed specifies that in the text which means David will have a son that will rule over the king of his uh, over the kingdom of Israel forever and this promise here in 2nd Samuel chapter 7 is an eternal promise um, so basically Yahweh promised David an eternal royal dynasty over Israel no matter what no matter what. So what that means is the only legitimate king of Israel, human king, the only legitimate king is God himself. We already established that. But the only legitimate human king must be from David. Because David, God will never take the throne away from David over Israel. That's the promise. And that happens in this context. Okay. But then we have the ending of David's story, which is set, um, and sets it up for what's gonna happen next. And so I call this King David's dark side. Immediately, well, maybe not immediately, but within, after God promised to give him an eternal royal dynasty, and God never takes his promises back, David commits both adultery and then murder, which breaks two of the 10 commandments. He has this faithful servant one of his most faithful men in his army, who was not an Israelite, but was a Hittite guy named Uriah. And Uriah had this wife named Bathsheba. And it talks about there's this time when the people are at war to try to expand their kingdom. Um, David fought a lot of wars. And David stayed behind this time. He didn't used to do that, but he stayed behind in his palace just to be comfortable. <laughs> and then he sees this woman bathing beautiful woman, and it's Bathsheba, and he says, bring her to me, to his people. So they bring her to him. He realizes that it's Uriah's wife, but he still decides to have an affair with her. And then he feels so bad about it because he gets her pregnant. Yes. Do you think that's where the word bath comes from? I don't know. That's a good question. I have to look at that later. She's bathing, and her name is Bathsheba. Yeah. Um, maybe. Curious. I don't know. 
But um, so he gets her pregnant. And so he's like, what am I going to do? Like, I committed adultery. This is my, one of my main men over here, Uriah. And Uriah is off at war. So he's like, I'm going to call Uriah home from war. So he calls Uriah home from war. And Uriah is like, why am I here? I need to help them out on the front lines. Like, they need me. And um, David says, oh, I just want you to have some time with your wife. So he, he gets Uriah drunk and he tries to fix it so that it looks like Uriah got her pregnant and not him. But he can't do that because Uriah is so honorable that he literally is just sleeping on the king's like doorstep. He won't even go to his own house. Um, and he wasn't even an Israelite, but this guy is just a man of honor. Um, but David's his king, of course. So what David decides to do is he's gonna, he tells Joab, the commander of the army, hey, um, make, have Uriah go to the front line and then have everybody else step back when, when the enemy comes to attack. And so Joab listens, and because of that, Uriah is all alone at the front, and the enemy strikes him down and kills him. And so David didn't himself murder Uriah, but he orchestrated his murder in a tactical way. And um, then the prophet Nathan, the same prophet who had told David, God will establish your house forever, the Lord tells Nathan what had happened, because Nathan didn't know. And Nathan comes and gives David this parable about a sheep, how there's this great man who had all these sheep, because David had a ton of wives. I didn't mention that yet, but he got Saul's daughter. There was some treachery there. But then he also got all these other wives. And even though he had all these women, that he could have sex with any of them, that he could be with any of these women, he took Bathsheba. And uh, Nathan compares this to a tiny little ewe lamb that one man has, just this tiny little ewe lamb, and he took that ewe lamb from Uriah, or from this man in the parable. And then Nathan says to David, give me your judgment as the king. What should be done to this man? He's like, that man should have everything taken from him. He should be destroyed. And, and he says, you are that man. <laughs> and he's like, what? And then he understands. And um, Bathsheba loses the baby, the baby that, uh, the pregnancy, because the Lord declares that that baby can't live because it's a result of sin. But, and then God also declares that he will humble David and punish basically David and his line because of that, but he won't take the throne from him because he promised David that a human king would reign over Israel forever through David, and that's going to be Jesus eventually, but that's the promise, so God won't change his promise. But what happens after this is that decline, basically, and David's, and then Solomon inherits the decline, but it starts declining. Um, so uh, first, David has all these sons and a daughter, right? And so there's a betrayal, number one. There's a son named Amnon that loves another daughter of David named Tamar. And he's so in love, he's obsessed with her. He's like, I gotta have her, I gotta have her, I gotta have her. So he rapes her. <laughs> He holds her down. He tricks her first to get her to come. He holds her down. He rapes her. And she's like, okay, well, I didn't like that you did that, but could you please just make me your wife because you defiled me? Like, I'll never be able to get a husband now because you did this to me. And Anon says, nah, I don't love you anymore. He's, he's like just super wicked. He just wanted to like use her for sex and whatever. And so Absalom, who's her brother, is pissed off. And they're all children of David. And he's like, how could you let one of your sons do that to your daughter and get away with it? Because David doesn't do anything. He just lets Amnon get away with this wickedness. And so Absalom says, whatever, I'm going to do it myself. So he kills Amnon. So one of David's sons kills the other son. And then Absalom, David's like, well, now i got to send you away. So he sends Absalom into exile. But then David misses him so much. He's like, he's my son. He's my son. I love him. So he brings him back. And he's so thankful. He says this cool thing about how returning from exile and stuff. I um, won't go into that right now. It's when that time. But <laughs> Absalom uh, then is so angry that he pretends that he's okay with David, but then he secretly goes around to all Israel and is like, I should be king. I should be king. And it says that Absalom was the most beautiful man alive at that time. So David wasn't as attractive as Absalom. Um, yeah, basically. What'd you say? So world's world's sexiest, sexiest, man. Man. sexiest man. Oh, yeah. He was the world's <laughs> sexiest man at the time. Um, and the people of Israel, they listen to Absalom. So Absalom successfully tries to overthrow, well, he doesn't, not entirely successful, but for a time, he kicks King David out of his own palace, 
and humiliates his father because what he does is he forces his father to leave the palace um, with some of the loyal supporters who still supported him. Um, but then he sets up a big old thing like a shrine or some sort of tent or something on the top of the roof and he starts having sex with all of his father's wives, which I know it sounds really gross, but in those days you did that kind of thing to humiliate somebody because you're like, hey, everybody look, this is, this is the king's wives. I'm, gonna, da, 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 I'm the king, you know, I'm, the, I'm the man, right? In front of that's everybody. what people do nowadays, they fuck right. each other's girls. You know? Yeah, that's the idea. Or that's hoping he wives. didn't have sex with his own mother. No, but it's, yeah, I mean, hopefully not. <laughs> that rapper's always like, I have your beer. Yeah, you know, he always fucks yeah. that, like, I got with your girl. So David's attitude through all this is just one of humility, like, I basically deserve this. There's even this guy cursing him in the midst of it, you know, curse you. And, and then one of David's generals is like, should I kill him? And David says, if the Lord put a curse in his mouth, he's the Lord. Like, I've, I've sinned, you know. And so David's just very humble about the whole thing. But it's very humiliating for him. And um, David's men, of course, do go to war with Absalom. And then in the midst of this, Absalom's hair is caught in this tree because he has this beautiful hair. And he's, his hair is caught in the tree, and then one of his men stabs him, Absalom, uh, without David being there. And then David hears about it, and he's like, oh, Absalom, my son, you killed my son. <laughs> Even though his son rebelled against him and humiliated yeah. him. Um, and then his general, because of this, is pissed. His general's named Joab. And um, he's like, you hate those who love you and you love those who hate you. You have humiliated all of Israel today like because of this. Because like they are serving David, but he's like mourning over his betrayer. This is his son. Mm -hmm. And so Joab's pissed. And because of that, Joab makes a plan to eventually rebel later on. Um, because what's going to happen is um, David's going to have another son with Bathsheba named Solomon. Actually, his real name is Jedediah. That's the name the Lord gave him. But, um, which means Yahweh's David. And, but he calls him Solomon, which means peace, because David want, just wants peace. <laughs> just a lot of war in his life. And um, so Solomon is the son of Bathsheba. And so in the people's mind, this is connected to all the horrible things that David did. It was a political scandal. Like, think of, like, what happened with Bill Clinton. I mean, that's not even as bad as what happened. I mean, excuse me. What happened with Bill Clinton is not even as bad as what happened here with David. That's, like, way worse. Um, so David had a man killed and took his life. And then to have a, a son that's going to be a future king with this woman that you did that with, I mean, it didn't look good. God approved of it, but to the people, like his, David's public approval rating plummeted like all the way down because of this. People are just sick of David because of this. On top of that, he decides that he's going to increase the tax burden because they need more taxes to build the temple. And he decides to take this census, not just that, but for the military too. He probably had ambition to like expand the kingdom further. So he takes a census, and because of that, and a lot of people don't understand, but when you take a census in those days, it means I'm going to raise the taxes. Like That's why you're doing that. And so God is angry because he's doing that. So God punishes Israel with a plague because of David's wickedness in this. And um, then David repents and offers a sacrifice, and um, he sees the angel of the Lord over the city, like, and he's just like, whoa, you know. And then the book of 2 Samuel ends. <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's kind of a sad ending. And um, one last story I'll tell you. Um, let me make sure I touched on all this here real quick. Yeah, so his, his census was a greedy thing to do. And it also shows the fulfillment of what Samuel says, because David is starting to lift himself up above the people. He's starting to. And that's not good. Doesn't mean that David didn't love God or whatever, but he's starting to exalt himself with pride above, above the people. Um, and so that's the ending. But then last thing I'll talk about, because this is the beginning of Kings, but it's important because it's the end of David's reign. When David's very old... He can't even reign anymore as king. He's bedridden. One of his other sons named Adonijah also has a rebellion. This is after Absalom. And the generals, including Joab, remember how Joab was so angry, how David reacted? Joab supports him. And the whole high priest, the Levite family that was leading 
support him too. So like all Israel is like against David's decision to make Solomon king. Yeah. And that's important because Solomon took the throne in that context with all these people against him. Um, so remember that for next week. But So yeah, David had a rough ending because of, uh, because of these sins. However, well, I'll ask, why is David excused? The Bible calls David a man after God's own heart in those two verses. Um, but David was far from perfect. His reign as king set the stage for division and rebellion among the Israelites. Because of what David really does here, and then Solomon after him is going to just put the nail in the coffin, but David started it, Israel's going to split in two, in half, and then that's going to be their downfall. So really, it was a big deal that David, because he was Yahweh's Messiah for his time. He could have led the world if he was a perfect man, which there's no such thing. David's going to say that. But if he was, he could have led the whole world into the prosperity and the Eden, back to Eden, where God wants. Mm -hmm. That's what Israel's supposed to do. That's what David was supposed to do, but he couldn't because he wasn't perfect. But why is he excused? And the simple answer is that God searched his heart and gave him grace. Um, in many ways, what he did is, you could look at it as worse than what Saul did, worse than on a human level. Mm -hmm. But because of his faith, and because God was his shield, he was protected. I talked about how the star of David in English, in Hebrew, is called Magen or Magen David, which means literally the shield of David. And it comes from a lot of different verses in the Psalms David wrote all over, but... This one from Psalm 18, it's parallel, it's also in 2 Samuel 22, the same passage where David writes the song praising God for how God is good to him. And he said, you have given me the shield of your salvation. Um, salvation's a word that means, it's a very Christian word, nobody really uses it outside of Christian context, but the idea isn't just saving someone, like rescuing them from danger. It's not just, oh look, here comes a fist, all around you, right, if you're here and there's this fist, it's not just, oh, let me take you out of the fist. The idea of this word in Hebrew, uh, Yesha and Yeshua, is, is this one, which sounds like the name for Jesus, because that's where it comes from, uh, is liberation, or the idea of to save by conquest. So the hand is coming, and the hand is, something comes in and destroys the hand completely. So the one who's there doesn't even have to move wow. where they are because the whole threat that's surrounding them is destroyed. Whoa. The root means to make wide. So the idea is that all the enemies coming in around you, if you look at it from like an aerial perspective, right? The enemies surrounding you and God comes in and just like completely and destroys that's what happens the enemy. in the end times too, right? We prophesied about Exactly. That? So that's the word salvation. Like it's a lot more epic than it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so you have given me the shield of your salvation, David says, and your right hand holds me up. And your gentleness makes me great. And so David has this wonderful revelation that I think Moses saw as well. Because Moses, the same Hebrew word is used for Moses. Remember how Moses was the most meek man, the most humble man on earth. Um, that's the word, meekness, humility, or loneliness. So you don't think highly of yourself. And that is God. Our God is a gentle God. He's, he's a humble God. And that's what Jesus shows in his whole life. And David saw that. Um, these last two are just verses that show David's great faith from the Psalms. This one in Psalm 27, he says, I trusted that I would see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Long for Yahweh, usually translated wait for, but long for is the sense of it. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Long for Yahweh. And then he says, where can I go from your spirit? Talking to God. Or where can I flee from your face. And then he says, Yahweh is my shepherd. I do not lack. And you have to understand, these things aren't as shocking for us today, but in David's own time, these are shocking statements of faith, every single one of these things. That he would believe that Yahweh is everywhere, that he would believe that God can protect him as a shepherd the same way that, that David did, with the same devotion that David was devoted as a shepherd. Um, to believe that he can bring David to the land of the living, um, he even says somewhere else, you will not let me see um, death forever. It's, it's worded in such a way that he believes in like a resurrection before there was even a promise of that. And then finally here in uh, Psalm 51, after he sins, as a response to that, in all his sin that David did, he says, against you, you only 
have I sinned and done what is evil in your eye, so that you are right in your word and clear when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you delight in truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Create for me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And so David sees that he's that it's just human nature to sin, and that those ideas of we're all sinners from birth, and that they come from the Psalms, and what David's saying, because he realizes it's just something in him, his desires are off, and so he's begging God, God, give me a clean heart. Don't just change me on the outside and make me look good. Make me tr true and good inside. And finally, most important of all, David somehow knew that Yahweh had a coming Messiah who was supposed to be the true Lord and King of Israel. Um, Psalm 110 is one of the clearest examples of this. There are others. But David says here, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter, that's the king's stick, right, from Zion, saying, have dominion in the midst of your enemies. So David somehow had this revelation of Jesus and Jesus later points this out and says, why is David calling this other one Lord when he was the king of Israel? So David knew that he was not the forever ruler of Israel, but there was another, um, the son of God, who is also God. To the extent of how David described that, we could debate that, and I don't know. And there's, I could talk a lot more about it, but I'll leave it at that. Um, just to show David's faith. So that is King David.